This is the Starlight Express Alumni Podcast. Hi, I'm Rod Weber, Starlight Express alumni. My story starts way back in 1990. I was a Broadway tour replacement. Um, I came in as an understudy for Greaseball and Rusty, and I ended up actually taking your place, Peter, as Bobo, because if you remember, you left the tour early. That's right. And I became your, your, uh, your following guy there. Oh, that's and, right. That's, uh, that's how it ties in. Yeah. And so I'm so glad that happened because my skating skills got, went way up from just doing the show every single night. And then two years later, I think it was, they were auditioning for uh, Starlight in Vegas. And um, I, was in, I was doing Cats in Zurich at the time. And I was so bummed because I wasn't going to be back in time for the auditions. And, uh, you know, I was like, well, someone else is going to get that. And, but as soon as I got back, I called uh, the producer, which was Troika. And um, I said, hey, I'm Rod Weber. I understudy Greaseball. I, you know, I, I, think, I think you should see me. If there's any opportunity, you're doing any callbacks, I can show up. And they're like, huh, Rod Weber, we've heard that name. Uh, yeah, come. Uh, we have a callback in like three weeks. So I came back and after the callback, um, they said, well, you're definitely our front runner. We'd love to hire you. We're just waiting for the Broadway contract or for the, the equity contract to go through. And then sure enough, a month later, I was in Las Vegas, um, for the role of Greaseball. Awesome. And I, and I did it there for three out of three and a half out of four years, three and a half out of four and a half years. Mm-hmm. The only time I took off was a year when, uh, Ron DeVito came in and, um, took over for a year and, uh, and then I came back and ran the rest of the contract. It was wow, sort of fun. That's, awesome. that's yeah. awesome. So what was what was the audition process like for you? <sighs> well, the very first one, I, I had just moved to New York, fresh out of college. Um, I had dreamed about uh, – I had had the soundtrack to Starlight Express, the London cast, the original. And uh, I and the very first Broadway, uh, Broadway tour or Broadway audition I ever did was Starlight Express, was for the tour. Mm-hmm. I think that was July of 1991, no, 1990, and um, I got kept to the end, like a other, bunch of other people did. They weren't hiring immediately, but they were looking for people for eventual replacements, and they said, you know what, um, just keep working on your skating, uh, we're going to, you know, we may call you back at any moment's notice, just work on your skating, and I think the next day or within a week, I had gone to Leslie Skate and Dance in Soho, mm-hmm. and uh and I started taking lessons twice a week from uh, Leslie himself. And uh, I just worked on it all summer, all fall. I think I even showed up to Central Park to just kind of get the feel of dancing on skates and things like that. And sure enough, in October, mid-October of 90, um, Tara Rubin called me. And, um, you know, Tara. Tara. And, uh, yeah. And um, we, I went to the audition. I was much cockier as a as a skater and that really pays off to be, uh, you know, really confident, of course. And I was like doing, you know, double toe stops, like racing towards the, uh, the audition table and all the dishers, uh, audition nears. I don't know what they call them. Auditioners. Uh, I was going towards them and I did a double backstop and like, they were like, ah, but it left an impression. And, um, and I was, you know, within um, two months of, no, no, I was hired on that one right away. So I went out, joined everyone in San Antonio. Wow, that was awesome. So you got so, so you got it. Got yourself on in the show. Yeah. And your first uh, rehearsals. Share with everyone what the rehearsals were like initially when you first you showed up. They hired you. You came on board. And your first days of rehearsals. What was that like? Oh, it was like lots of blisters. That's all I remember. Just, um, I got brand new <laughs> brand new skates, of course, like you do, and. Mm-hmm. Um, Started working with Tammy Gantz at the time. Mm-hmm. She had been on tour for a little bit, I believe. And so I was, I think I was her first or second, like, person that she was training from scratch. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I met Michael Fraley for a while. I think he was off the tour at that point, but maybe he came back on and um, for, you know, a couple weeks later. And I remember George Smeros and I were both training around the same time. He came mm-hmm. in just a couple weeks earlier than me. Or no, he had a, he broke an ankle or something, I can't remember Anyway, it was retraining, and um, I just remember skating on carpets in uh, in the lobbies of all these theaters because we didn't have a proper place to rehearse. You know, mm-hmm. you had the stage, or if you weren't ready for the stage, the stage could be very scary if you weren't a good skater. 
with all those ramps and stuff you can fly right. into the audience so uh you know you're working on these in these uh lobbies of all these theaters mm -hmm. you know and every week it was a different theater at that point so it was a we're going okay how are we going to rehearse this week uh, how are we going to rehearse this week so it always always was changing but what was the most challenging thing for you with the skating? Was it the, what part of the skating was the most challenging? Were you able to bring together the, the skating and the singing? And what was all <laughs> that like? Bring it all together. You know, I because I had already trained a little bit of skating. I I think I just picked it up pretty quickly. But you yeah. know, the challenge with skating was um, being comfortable on the stage so that you didn't have to think about skating. Yeah. You know, so it, it was just second nature. Because the first time I went on as an understudy, I think I went on for turn off for a week. Mm -hmm. And um, oh my God, I was grabbing the sides of the bowls to oh. make sure I didn't fall over. Because I was like in the back mm -hmm. and, and doing spins. And I think a spin got out of control. And I, I was grabbing the stage. And luckily, I was in the back. And the audience probably didn't even notice, of course, with all the, the mm -hmm. smoke and CO2 blowing or nitrogen. Mm -hmm. they, they never probably even saw me. But uh, um. That was, yeah, and then, like I said, when I got to go on for you full-time for that last month or two mm -hmm. after you had left, uh, it just changed the whole situation. I was always nervous about going on, and after doing that, then I was just like, oh, yeah, I got this, which wow. paid off for me playing greaseball, uh, you know, two years later in Las Vegas. Well, how did you get, how did you get greaseball? How did, how did that work out? <sighs> well, um, I remember I heard a friend of mine was had auditioned for – for Vegas, and like I said, I was still in Europe, um, and I missed the auditions. I was so bummed. He was back from Cats. He he got an audition. And they told him that he was the front runner, and as soon as I got back, I met up with a bunch of my ex Cats friends, and I heard that, and I'm like, wow, maybe they'll, you know, I'm better. I'm a better skater than he is. I'm a better singer than he is. So, you know how we think competitively like that, and I'm like, they they got to see me too. So uh, that's when I called Troika directly and said. You know, you have to see me, and um, or I'd love you to see me, uh, and slightly aggressive on it. Like, you know, you have, if you haven't chosen anyone yet, you should at least see me before you you make any decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, they responded positively, and uh, and like I said, I uh, after I went to the audition a week later, they contacted me and said, "You are definitely the one we'd like to do this. Do you know? Do play grease ball." Um, I think I maybe came in for one more callback, but. Uh, you know, then I was just waiting for the contract to happen. And, and then once we got, got the contract, then flights were booked. I flew to Las Vegas on, I think, July 4th of 1993. Okay. I remember seeing the, the fireworks in the air as I was landing. Very cool. And it all happened very fast from there. Wow. That's awesome. That's great. That's great. Great. What's your greatest memory then? I mean, I know that you have a lot of memories and things happen, and but... When I ask the question, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? I would say opening night uh, in Las Vegas because it was a huge spectacle, you know, huge spectacle. Everyone in, the, in town was waiting to hear about this Starlight Express new show that was coming, and it was a Android Weber musical, and um, and just it was just a really special night. We, it, you know, the, in Las Vegas they do things up for an opening night. Mm -hmm. They had giant replica train cars i mean that you could get in and sit in the window you know in these uh i think it was like probably some expo center there at las vegas hilton where they had the huge uh you know debut party mm -hmm. um it was pretty pretty cool i kind of felt like i made it at that point Very cool. Very <laughs> from, being cool. a, from being a chorus boy to being playing a lead in a in a in starlight express was pretty memorable that's awesome. Now, uh, I know many of us that did Starlight, uh, we drew, uh, we learned things during that time that be, now, at least for me, and I know a couple of alumni also uh, said the same thing, that some of the things that I learned during my, uh, my work with Starlight yeah. became life lessons that now, to this day, I still draw on. What are some of the life lessons that you would say that you learned during your experience um, it's a great, great question because prior to this point in my life, every role at every job I'd ever gotten, I just kind of got because I was naturally talented in a, you know, to a certain extent. And um, Star Express was one of those where hmm, it was my br first Broadway possibility, uh, the Broadway tour. And so I really just, you know, like I said, I 
I went to skating lessons and I took started taking voice lessons in New York City. Uh, I remember going to some audition and someone said I had a small voice. I saw one of the, you know how they write on the back of your resume? And it wasn't for Starlight, but it was another show. And they said something small voice. And I was like, I don't have a small voice. And then I was like, well, maybe I should get some voice lessons. And sure enough, I realized I do. I did have a small voice. And it didn't take that long. You know, just diligence. The, you persevere and you're constantly working on it. And, and I was very driven at that time in my life. So I was skating every twice a week. I was uh, taking dance classes three times a week. I was uh, going to acting class twice a week. So you just realize that all your skills just keep building and you get become more comfortable and you get in a really tip top audition shape. And, um, and before you know, it, you start getting a callback or you, and after that you start getting, you know, uh, a couple callbacks a week and then maybe, maybe even more and things just get better and better as you keep working at your skill. So rather than just relying on, you know, my natural talent, I was building and creating, you know, enhancing my t talent. Wow. So that happens from hard work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, I uh, know oh, the one thing that uh, I learned from that also was, uh, was working hard, hard work, hard work, hard work. Yeah. And then um, you said it a couple of times, your, your mindset was very, let's say you use the word aggressive and you, you, and this was mentioned a couple of, that word was used a couple of times in some of the, uh, with some of the alumni aggressive you have to have that mindset to do a show like this you have to have that like your, your double uh, double uh, uh you know toe stop back <laughs> stop yeah. thing yeah that's, that's very full-on aggressive and it's very it was, characteristic of a greaseball greaseball needs to be yeah, that way i know but the show so, calls for that right so i a better word than aggressive is cocky you know cocky. <laughs> it, took, it took a bit of cockiness and yeah. and that just really paid off for me doing that um like I said, they, I was in their minds, and the next time they had a chance to hire me, they, they, uh, they, they hired me. So, yeah, cockiness. I, I think cockiness pays off a lot in this business when you're auditioning. Oh, without Co crazy. you know, confidence. Just you know, hey, yeah, nothing can stop me. Sort of. Yeah, you have to have the, and I tell my students the same thing. I tell everyone the same thing. You have to have the audacity to think that I belong here, and not only do I belong here that I can take it to a whole new level that's going to get the attention of other people so that so much so that they're going to say, you know what, I want you for whatever uh, I'm doing at the time, whatever project, whatever. So you you have to have that kind of confidence. And I know when I went to my first or uh, my audition for Starlight, that was it because I have I was 14 months on a tour with Sesame Street. And uh, that's when I learned how to skate in right. costumes. And, and so, a lot of you guys came from and, there. Yeah, and, I, and yeah, exactly. Uh, Angel Vargas, Ron Garza, Kim Gladman, yeah, a lot yeah, of Gladman. you know, a lot of you came from that. And I know that uh, uh, when I and I was also a ballet dancer, and wow. so when I auditioned <laughs> in New York for the German production initially in uh, '88, I think '88, and uh, it was so easy. I, I was able to dance so naturally, but I was so aggressive because I was very athletic. I mean, I was. You know, I was a straight guy and I wanted to prove that I was straight right. I know. way back I in the day, that. you know, which I never had a problem with, but I just wanted to, you know, I, that's the way I was very aggressive. So Starlight. And so you have to have that confidence, this cockiness to believe that, you know, what, I belong here. And I remember going all the way to the front. I remember and, you know, I remember uh, Ilse was there and a the girl that helped out was Nancy. And then, of course, Arlene. And I was jamming. I was just kicking it out. We did, did wide smile. I remember I was doing a combination of wide smile choreography and yeah. uh, Rocky with a chest roll. And I love yeah, it. Right, right. Uh -huh. yeah, so, the worm thing. Yeah, exactly. But you got to be cocky. You got to be aggressive. And that that's that has still to this, this day serves me mm -hmm. in everything that I'm doing. And so I mean, even though Starlight is a, a, an important part of my life, it's not my whole life. There's so many things that I'm doing especially on, on now every day so yeah. what are you doing now i mean starlight's a part of your life but what are you doing these days that you have a passion for that you're really uh uh excited about well i in 2006 i did my last broadway show ring of fire uh, and i met my wife and that just kind of changed things for me i felt like hey I don't, i'm not really out here to impress anyone anymore i i kind of want to i i never had i never loved performing so much that I had to do with the rest of my life. I, I had other passions. I was always 
you know, the guy that everyone came to with computer problems. I was, I always had a video camera in my hand. I don't know if you remember on tour, but I usually had my video camera wherever we went. And, um, and so later on in life, after I'd done, you know, a pretty, a pretty steady working career for about 16 years or so, um, and playing a rock, you know, being a rock star for, with Transfer and Orchestra for three years. And, uh, all these dreams came true that I was like, Hey, you know what? I, I want to, I want to do some other things I've always wanted to do. And I had someone recommending that I should go into video because they thought I was really good at it. And I was like, huh, maybe I should try that. And I did some films, some short films that won like nine awards from different, nine different film festivals. And, and I just started getting a good repertoire of, of work. And uh, I went into business as a video producer. And so Very that's what cool. I've been doing now. I'm a director of photography. Uh, some of the skills I learned in Starlight when being cocky I have applied to like cover letters to um, to directors and and producers for feature films and such, and just coming off as like I I'm the guy you you need and and real cocky and and it's paid off because people are like, you know I've been on the other side where you don't want to have to worry about someone you hire you want them to go I want to hire them and have all my problems be taken care of, right. so when you so as a caster director you hire someone who's cocky you feel like they're going to make sure they're good because mm -hmm. they're they're you know they're acting cocky they're they're putting themselves behind it. Whereas if someone is timid, you just you know you're just not going to get the job because they're not sure if you're going to be strong enough to to make their lives easier. Basically, you know. Yeah, without question, I know I know in the business that I'm I'm in is that uh, I I want to find out as soon as possible if somebody's going to work or not. And mm -hmm. if they're timid and very shy or have fear or doubt or uncertainty, then I right away, I can't use them because I don't know whether yeah. they're going to work or not. I want to find out now. Are you going to yeah. work right now? Now? <laughs> you don't want to have to worry. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love the fact that when you called up, uh, you called up and you said, hey, look, you know what? If you haven't, bo you haven't booked someone or, or, or cast someone for this role, uh, you know, you really need to see me. <laughs> <laughs> because that, that, that's applicable to everything. And I think that if uh, more, well, I love the fact that one to 3% of us do that because then the other 97% statistically, give or take, uh, don't. But mm -hmm. uh, I tell everyone that you should because I want to hear that because I cast and, and you want to hear that. Whether, you, whether I hire you or not, I'll yeah. remember that. And if your skill sets match up to your cockiness, then I definitely want to keep you on my list. <laughs> and you know, and the, and the, you've heard the term of "fake it till you make it," but yeah. in acting, I think that pays off so many ways. Um, because if you, you know, people are afraid they're going to get the job, but worry about after you've got the job, then worry about fulfilling because you have already got enough skills mm -hmm. to be considered. So, right. um, I, I think that uh, just putting yourself out there uh, is, is half the work. Putting yourself out there in a very uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Confident way mm -hmm. will get you so much more work. Well, now if somebody wanted to find out more about you, and I think you do have a website, right? Uh, yeah, I haven't really picked up on that. I, I'm working on a uh, video videographer uh, producer website. Mm -hmm. I've got a bunch of other things. I I've never had the time to do it because luckily, I work enough in this business as a video person that um, I've never had to advertise. Right. I think maybe the first year or two I had to make some connections, but mm -hmm. word of mouth travels and if you do a good job uh, that you get recommendations and I'm working you know, more days than I care to work a, a year. So uh, I haven't really done a website, but uh, you know, there comes a point in your life where you're like, hey, I, I want some residual income mm -hmm. and uh, I want to have bigger uh, revenues. So then you start thinking, okay, let's do a website and start start a branding thing, right, right, right. but I don't have a website. Sorry. Right. So if somebody want to find out more about your work and the work that you've done, where can they go? Should they just Google you? Now guys, uh, let me talk to yeah. some people out there that are watching right now. If you guys are watching or listening right below on the, this page here, I'll have links and I'll, of course I'll do some research and then Rod will send me um, some pics and I'll find stuff. There's stuff out there because you know, Google is an amazing place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, what I have is um, I have a, uh, a Vimeo page, mm -hmm. and it's uh, Vimeo.com slash surreal, as in surreal, like Mr. Real, um, yes. S-I-R-R-E-E-L. Perfect. And uh, that's 
my website that I use to show my work. It's yeah. not completely up to date, but uh, but but you're working and you and people who need to know you know you. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you know I take on all sorts of projects from very small ones. I've, I've been doing a lot of work for a company called Barstool Sports, which you may or may not have heard of, but they've become a real um, internet presence uh, for video and and sports and stuff. And I work for them a lot. Um, so I'm sure some of the people out there have heard of Barstool Sports, but I'm there a couple of days a week working for them. Well, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing on that. So I always like to have you guys have the last word. What's the last? There's a lot of fans that are watching this, Starlight fans. Ah. There, this this podcast is really take, has taken off crazy. And mm -hmm. also a lot of alumni are loving this. And for them, it's, you know, it's just a powerful part of their lives mm -hmm. and so they're loving it so i want to give you the last word to the fans and to the alumni yeah well i would say uh you know youth is wasted on the youth so back when i was doing starlight express and uh you know all these in vegas and all these things were happening and you kind of took these things for granted and then as you get older in life you realize wow that was an amazing period of my life uh probably the best memories except for the getting married and, and having my, my son, um, that is probably, you know, my time in Vegas doing Star Express is probably some of the most memorable of my entire life. And I'll, I have memories from there and I have friends from there that I'll have the rest of my life. I run into people or I see them on Facebook and if I ever get in touch with them and talk to them, it's like no time has passed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's something about when you're in a cast or Star when you're on a tour with, with a cast, you're spending so much time together for such a short amount of time that you almost become a family. You pretty much, you do become a family. And mm -hmm. you see someone 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, and it's like no time has changed. You give a hug, you say, how are you doing? And you reminisce a little bit and you swear you're gonna get stay in better touch until the next time you see them. And, and uh, some really great friendships. Yeah. That's- yeah, I know. We're like brothers and sisters because of Starlight, because we- yeah. We we, uh, we bled, we cried, and we broke our bodies yes. <laughs> for the same reason to tell this story. So, yeah. uh, so it's been it's it's a it's been a remarkable journey for me. And so now this is the next part. Now we got we have young people. We have the children of children that are doing the show, like wow. Debbie, daughter Lauren, and uh, also one of the starlighters that I interviewed. She uh, uh, she is the daughter of one of the MDs of the original Starlight in London. Oh, and wow. She ended up being uh, Dinah and then turned out being uh, Pearl, ended up being Pearl. And so it's incredible. So I, so they, uh, we were the guinea pigs on the way back, those of us that started way at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, But they are standing on the shoulders and Starlight is still growing and it's, yeah. it's history now, musical theater history. And yeah. we're part of that. And so I appreciate you spending this time with me and sharing. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for you know creating this. And I think it's a really special thing you're doing. Thank you, everyone, for joining me on this episode of Starlight Express Alumni Podcast. Next week, I will get together with another alumni. Be sure to subscribe. You can subscribe right here on the website at starlightexpress.club. We are definitely on the iTunes and Stitcher and we're looking to get on the other platforms so make sure you check there subscribe there and stay connected if you are a Starlight alumni please be sure to reach out to me if you would like to be on the podcast would love to hear your stories and share your story with the Starlight Express fans and other alumni look forward to sharing with you next week everyone have a great day Thank you.